and I'd like to welcome you to this week's An Audience with the President. Uh, this has become a weekly feature over these past few months and a great opportunity for us to have these interactive discussions on a wide range of subjects. So to begin with, I'm going to hand over to Minister David Bruton, as you know, the President of the Spiritual National Union, and he can introduce to you the topic for this week and his guest. So, I hand over to you, David. Thank you, Al. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening to you all. Brilliant that you can join us, and tonight I know is going to be a very special evening. We talk much in spiritualism about the pioneers, the people that laid the foundations of the movement and shaped modern spiritualism. And tonight, the two gentlemen that we're going to be focusing upon undoubtedly played a considerable part uh, throughout the 20th century. And their work, their life's work, in effect, in many respects, is still serving us to shape the movement that we all are part of today. I speak, of course, of Arthur Findlay and Gordon Higginson such important characters and I hope tonight from the two guests I've invited to join us we will get an insight into the men behind the name, the reality of these uh, stalwarts of modern spiritualism. My first guest tonight is Paul Jacobs, CSNU. Uh, Paul has been a spiritualist since 1983 the first spiritualist church he visited was Wolverhampton SNU Church in the West Midlands in England. And in his own words, it was like coming home. And I know that many of us have experienced that feeling when walking into a spiritualist church. He recognized that he'd found something, but he didn't quite know what it was. Uh, the lady taking the service when he went to Wolverhampton turned out to be Paul's great aunt, Lavinia whom he actually hadn't seen for quite some time, and he didn't even know she was a medium, so it was quite a shock to him. Um, it was through Lavinia some months later that Paul was taken to Longton Church, again in the West Midlands, in Stoke-on-Trent, uh, where he met Gordon Higginson. Uh, Gordon, at the time, was the president of Longton Church, and also, of course, president of the Spiritualist National Union, principal of the Arthur Finlay College, and without doubt, one of the finest all-round mediums of the 20th century. From that time, Gordon became a friend to Paul, a mentor, and taught him not only to recognize how to unfold his own uh, latent mediumistic gifts, but he helped Paul to develop his mediumship and the way that he worked with the spirit world in many aspects. He took his first demonstration back in 1990 after seven years of intense development under the guidance of Gordon and Martin Young. And that's how we did those things in those days. Uh, development seems to happen a lot quicker late today than it did then, but that's a discussion all in itself. In 1990, 1993 proved to be a very important year for Paul. He became a tutor at the Arthur Finlay College, which was a major step for him. Having spent six years organizing courses, now he had to teach as well. And of course, as many of us realize, in 1993, Gordon took his transition to the spirit world. And Paul followed him as the president of Longton Church. And he also gave up his business to become a professional medium. From that point where he took that great plunge into mediumship, uh, no easy task as I'm sure many would appreciate, he has become internationally renowned and literally now teaches uh, almost I think on every continent uh, in the world and is well respected uh, both as a tutor, a teacher and a medium in his own right. So Paul can I welcome you and thank you very much for joining us. My pleasure, David. It's really nice to be here. The next guest I have, um, I hope she won't, she'll forgive me for saying this, but uh, she's not actually a spiritualist. At least she's not a member of the union, unless she's snuck in when I, did, when I wasn't looking. 
Uh, I speak, of course, of Tanya Smith, who is the general manager of the Arthur Finley College. Tanya took on the challenge of running the Arthur Finley College back in 2011 after a career in hotels and the leisure industry. She felt it was time for a new challenge and what a challenge it turned out to be. Uh, Tanya, as many of you will know, is the daughter of Linda Smith, who is the president of Nor Norwich Church. So she was actually brought up within a spiritualist family. And I know she's often spoken about remembering a visit to the Arthur Finley College where she sat on the lawn. She didn't actually want to go into the college. She just wanted to sit on the back lawn. And I wonder then if the, the teenage Tanya uh, ever dreamed that she would end up running the college and managing this prestigious place for spiritualists. So Tanya, we're so pleased you, that you're here and thank you very much for joining us. Thank you so much, thank you. So what I've asked uh, our two guests to do this evening is to each take five minutes to talk. Obviously, Paul is going to talk about Gordon. Tanya is going to talk about Arthur. And then I'm going to ask um, one or two questions that I'd like to start the ball rolling with. And then once again, as always, we are going to uh, open up to anybody in the room. We've currently got 133 people joining us. So if you have questions, as Alva said, either uh, write them in the chat box or if you raise your hand we may well bring you in the room to ask the question personally so without further ado an hour seems like a long time but it's all often too short uh, especially for the fascinating subject that we're going to cover tonight i'd like to ask paul please to start and share your memories of gordon mons higginson uh, thank you, David. It's a uh, pleasure to be here and share. And I always appreciate the opportunity to speak about Gordon. Um, in the November of 92, driving down to the Arthur Finley College, I said to Gordon in the car, I said, Gordon, you know, I said, you've not let anybody know what you want when it's time for you to go. And he turned to me and he says, you cheeky hound. He says, I'm not going anywhere at the moment. And, um, but he then sat and he told me what he would like and what he wanted um, for the future. And of course, he then passed in um, 9, January 1993. I knew and experienced Gordon and happy to ask questions. Um, as the president in all his positions, the principal, and as uh, president of Longton Church. Um, but for me, what was important, even though he was this wonderful medium, uh, everybody um, admired and wanted to know and experience, I would say for me, the man and the friendship was the most important thing. And when I was introduced to him by my great aunt and great uncle outside Longton Church, he was standing on the pavement, and as we were introduced and we shook hands, at those days I didn't know I was a medium and not looking to be a medium. And as we shook hands, I heard a voice say to me, you're going to become friends. And I thought, oh, what's this? And automatically though, I said back to the voice, whose voice it was, I don't know. I said, I would never use his med his, the friendship for his mediumship. And I never did. I never asked him for one thing as the president, as the principal, um, or as the medium, or as the teacher. Yes, he did give to me, and he did share. And as a teacher, I've got to say um, very much here that his way of teaching, even though Ellen um, Simon will back me up, um, because we experienced together at the same time with Gordon, he taught us, but he didn't teach us. He would tell us what he wanted, and it would be for us to find out how and why. So very much Gordon was one for being able to see the potential of a natural ability, and then he would then set you these tasks, and you would then have to find the answers for your Still, and it worked. And you know, yes, I know formal training, and um, there has to be. But Gordon very much believed in this power, this inspiration, and this naturalness. But also, if it was the right time, and that your gift had got to come to the service and was ready to move forward. So he, he very much taught in that way. And so, in a way, he didn't teach us a lot. I can remember him saying at one time to me, Paul, I want you to do this. And we were in the sanctuary. And I said, Gordon, I said, uh, why and how? 
And he says, that's for you to find out. But I did it. I found out how. But I also found out the reason why. And it did that within our mediumship, but also as teachers, it would throw us in the deep end. Um, as a, a lecturer, I can remember with Simon, Simon's first lecture, we weren't teachers at the college. He took, we, took, we went down for a couple of days and asked Simon to do a lecture um, on a particular subject for the first time. And afterwards, um, he said to Simon, and I'm sure Simon won't mind me sharing, he said to him, Simon, you definitely got the bones there, but there needed to be a lot more meat on the bones. And that's how Gordon spoke to us. He never paid us compliments. Often publicly, he would say to me, Paul, do you think you're going backwards rather than forwards? But I didn't crumble. You know, where today people are probably going for a complaining about you if you said that today to a student. You know, and I know another time, I, you know, I think it was my last time at the college in the sanctuary, I gave a contact. I was quite pleased with myself. And he said to me, he says, are you finished? I said, yes. He said, so you don't want to be a good medium? I said, yes. Well, he said, instead of just telling me this and that and that, tell me that, that and that. And I have to get back up and do it. And then when I finished, and he says, now that's the difference between an average medium and um, a good medium. So, you know, he would push and strive. He never paid compliments um, at all. The only time I ever got a compliment from him, and I think Simon will remember this, we were at Longton Church and even though he was the president, he was breaking the rules. And it was the president's Monday evening, 1st January, and he said to me and Simon, um, we're going to begin this evening with psychometry, not just uh, a demonstration of um, mediumship. And Simon looked at me and Simon didn't want to do it. I said, well, I'm not used to doing psychometry either. And I said to Simon, I said, oh, okay, I'll go first. And I did this side commentary reading. And then when I'd finished, Gordon said, now I want you to move to the spirit, which I did. And then on the way home, he said to me, Paul, you did very well with that side commentary. And I said, yes, yes, I was quite surprised. I said, but I messed the contact up. He said, it's your own fault. You've only got yourself to blame. And I said, calm down. He says, I said, well, tell me why. He said, you did the job in five minutes, but you decided to carry on for another five minutes and mess it up. You got yourself to blame. And, you know, but, you know, I think everybody will know from what they know of him. It wasn't just his demonstrating skills as a medium. I very much experienced him as a healer. I would go out with him and, and join him with his private patients who couldn't get to church. He could do um, diagnosis in trance, which he changed later to doing through colour and the aura. He said it was quicker and easier and just as accurate as, the, as Dr. John in the trance mediumship. I witnessed his physical mediumship, the stories I could tell you um, from that. And um, he didn't have an easy time. Um, he, you know, he was a public man, but a private man. He um, also, you know, he was a very lonely man, even though many people wanted to be friends. And that's why the friendship was, was important um, for me to be able to give him. And people couldn't understand why he had the friendship, especially when they hadn't got it and wanted that friendship, was because I could, would just simply be me. You know me, David, you, you get what you say, and that's it. And that's how I was with Gordon. But people would put these spiritual overcoats, and he would ask me my opinions on things. And even to assessing mediums, even before I was a medium, he'd get me to do that. I can remember at the college, we'd got the, I don't know whether it's the 21st, 25th anniversary of the college, and we had a big marquee in the garden, and all the top trans mediums of the day were there to do a trans demonstration. And he said, I had to go into every one. There was Ursula Roberts, uh, Ivy Northage, Albert Best, himself, all of them. And, uh, and he says, and then at the end of the day, I want you to come to my room and give me an assessment on every one of them. And, uh, and he used to do that even at the church. I would have supper with him after a Sunday service and I would have to give him an assessment. I'd never been taught how to do assessment. I can remember my first assessment, even though I wasn't official a teacher at the college, we was in the gallery where you're sitting um, now. And um, he said, Paul, he said, see that man and gentleman at the end? I said, yes, he said, I wish you to give him an assessment. I said, but I don't, I've never done one. I don't know how to do them. He says, you're doing one now. And uh, so I went and did the assessment. I came back and Gordon said, uh, and what did you tell him? I told him not to give up his day job and become a full-time, not to become a full-time medium. And Gordon smiled and he says, that's correct. I said to him, 
that's why you didn't want to do it because you didn't want to tell it, but you <laughs> need to do it instead. I think one of the things I do re regret, um, and and I hope you don't all mind me saying this, I know um, that before he passed the spirit world, after he had his stroke, there was a lot he wanted to do for the movement. And people may not know this either. I said to him, Gordon, you know, as president of the union, principal of the college, um, president of the church, which is your first love? And if you could only have one of them, which one would you choose? And I was expecting him to say the college, and it wasn't, it was the union. That was his first love, and that's what he wanted to change. But he also realised before he passed the spirit world, there was changes that needed to be made, big radical changes. He shared some of them publicly, not all, and he shared some privately. And um, he couldn't stay here long enough to manifest um, those things. I'm happy to share with them publicly and privately with people. Um, so that was sad in a way. And he gave so much of himself. And, you know, the monetary means meant nothing to me. He died quite a poor man, really. Actually, when I lost everything, he, I took him to for therapy after he had his stroke. And um, he stopped at the bank and he, gave, he took £3,000. He says, Paul, this is yours. I know you've lost everything. Um, he said, that's all I've got. I said, I can't possibly take it, Gordon. Um, you know, we've got holes in the roof. I can remember the first week I organised for him at the college. Um, as you know, David, there were block booking weeks run by churches and the uh, districts. And uh, at the end of the week, I paid him his wages. I gave him £300. It was in 1986. And he says, what's that? I said, that's your wages. He said, bro, I've not done any sittings. I said, so? Oh, I can't possibly have that if I've not done any sittings. I said, Gordon, there's 90 people here. They've all come here for you. And he said, I've never been given anything like that in my life before. And uh, he said, he said, I'll only take it, he said, if you take the same amount for doing all the work in organising and, and, and looking after the week. When I used to, after he had his stroke, I took him for two years solid travelling the country. And not, not only would they pay him a fee, Unless I asked for the petrol money, most of them didn't think they even had to pay him the petrol money. You know? um, it was, you know, I've seen, I've seen a letter from royalty from not England, other countries, offering a million pounds for a physical science. And he said to me, and I said to him, Gordon, you're not going to go, are you? And he says, no. I said, you'd go to the beggar down the street, though. And he'd just look and he would just smile. And... And that's where it was, you know, he, he just lived the spirit. But he, he's a person, he, he was a beautiful man. He, he loved to see people laughing. He loved company. So I remember when we first went to the college as sort of, not official tutors, but trainees, he was um, guiding us through, bringing us through. Um, we'd always have to make everybody the tea and toast in the medium's room um, before me and Simon could go and enjoy ourselves in the bar. Uh, but he just loved to have everybody there telling stories laughing and, and joking but in the beginning i'll finish next i know my time's up um, he um, um i was at uh, the first seminar in um, st Anne's, and there's mavis patilla there glenn edwards and um, i was sitting at the bar and having a drink and he came up to me and he said paul why is it every time i come anywhere near you your auric field just closes up like a book because uh, I was scared to death and could see all the horrible things or not so nice things I'd done in my life because uh, it was this wonderful me. and he said to me Paul there's no need you know he said I know everything I need to know about you uh, so I thought well if he knows everything and he still wants to be friend stop worrying about it so I let my auric field open back up again but he just loved people but he loved people to be themselves and so many people couldn't be themselves with him and that's why he found it hard to be the real him and the real Gordon the man and the person and that's the part I miss even though his mediumship was absolutely wonderful I sat next to him to do with the trance and through him I was fortunate to meet some wonderful mediums who befriended me as well like Albert Best and Mary Duffy, Margaret Pearson, uh, Betty Wakelin, Ursula Roberts, I, I, I could just, Ron Baker, absolutely wonderful gentleman, and um, you'll remember him, David, remember him doing a lecture called um, uh, The Ship of Spiritualism. I've never forgot it. You know, it's been 30 odd years ago, 
And I've never forgot that lecture. It was amazing. So through Gordon, I was able to meet all these wonderful um, people and not just him. You know, I could talk all day. So I'm sorry, I think I've taken more than my time. All right, Paul, thank you. I will come back to you in a minute. I think you've exceeded your five minutes, but we'll forgive you. Go on, mate. (laughs) We should have made it all all Gordon, but never mind. So Tanya, you now have the challenge to balance the persona, the mediumship of Gordon uh, and all that he was to the movement uh, with a gentleman who equally was very, very important, Arthur Finlay. Tanya. Thank you, David. So, excuse me, I'm sitting in glorious sunshine now, so I'm, I'm kind of illuminated. <laughs> Hopefully it's uh, Arthur Finlay's spirit like giving me some strength. Anyway, um, I sadly didn't know Arthur Finlay, but I certainly have equal enthusiasm for his work and his life. Um, All of the information that I've gathered has simply been through a labour of love, most of which the information I found in the museum here at the college. So Arthur was born in Scotland. He was born on the 24th of May in 1883 in Glasgow. And he was a descendant from ancient kings of Scotland. He was a keen writer and an artist. And there's lots of his work and pictures and examples in uh, upstairs in his scrapbooks and, and hidden around in the corridors in the college. So next time you're here, have a little seek out of those lovely pictures that he's done. Most of uh, his education was um, in Scotland, but he was brought down to the UK to warmer climes and he was um, at the Fetz College and also then the the Geneva University. But for me, I absolutely adore and I've I've spent many an hour, day, month going through his scrapbooks because he's got lots of scrapbooks where he has meticulously scheduled and and kept all of his work um, and also things from his historic past both here at the college and through his childhood. One of my favourite scrapbooks is one that he was given when he was three years old and it's still here at the college today, it's beautiful. Now Arthur, his first job, believe it or not, was with his his grandfather. He adored his grandfather and um, he worked with him his father was his grandfather was a, a ship owner. Um, he was one of the first ship owners to take um, people over to Australia, and I think it was called the Timaru ship. Anyway, his grandfather gave him employment, and he was he earned ten pounds the whole year. In his second year of employment, he was employed for fifteen pounds a year, and in his third year of employment, he earned twenty pounds. So after which time, of course, he got employment for himself and he became self-sufficient. He was an avid reader, even from a young child. um, He was already into reading things of comparative religion. It didn't go down too very well with his parents, though, because his mother, when she found out that he was reading all different kinds of religions, she burnt his books. So um, he was rather unpopular. When his father died, um, he was about 25 years old and he became a senior stockbroker and chartered accountant in a firm in Glasgow. He was also a member of the Stock Exchange and he was a partner of his father's founded company. He was also a member of Lloyd's of London. Arthur Finley, he retired at the age of 40 years old, believe it or not, from active um, employment. But during the times of his employment, And after that time, he was a magistrate in both Essex and Ayrshire up in Scotland. He was a freeman of Glasgow and he was an awarded an OBE in World War I for the efforts that he did with the Red Cross. He retained an interest in finance and wrote many articles on that subject. And he was chairman of several companies. Uh, To us, he was best known for his books and addresses on history, spiritualism, philosophy and religion, of course. Now, on the 20th of September of 1918, that was when his interest and he became a, a dedicated spiritualist via a meeting that was by chance with John Sloan. And the medium John Sloan was um, a friend of a gentleman that, where he attended a church. 
but John Sloan gave him some information from his grandfather that absolutely nobody else could have known. Arthur Finley came to the conclusion that most gods and other deities worshipped in religions were in fact simply spirits of deceased humans. His interest increased and in 1920 he founded the Glasgow Society for Psychical Re Research and in 1923 he took part in the Church of Scotland's inquiry into psychic phenomenon. In the same year that he, of 1923, he retired from his profession and purchased Stansted Hall. And in 1932, he became a founding member of Psychic News. That's, a, of course, to many of you may know, but it's a spiritualist newspaper. And he founded that with Hannon Swaffer and Maurice Barbonell. He also helped to found the International Institute of, of Psychical Research of which he became the chairman. He also became an honorary member of both the American Foundation for Psychical Research, Edinburgh Psychic College, and the, he was the honorary president of both the Institute of Psychic Writers and Artists and the Spiritualist National Union. Mr. Finney loved horses and he rode out with his family at most weekends. The large lounge when he was here was I thought I'd introduce you to some of his house and how he lived here. Um, the large lounge, as I repeat, it was the family parlour that's just here behind me. And the children were allowed in there in, on, on Sundays, only Sundays with, when they were in formal dress. The blue room was Mrs. Finley's boudoir, where she used to run the house. And then, of course, in later times, when Mrs. Finley passed to spirit, it became Arthur's bedroom. The lecture room, of course, was the formal dining room. And the library, which is just in front of me here, is um, where he wrote most of his books and seances. Now, World War II came along during his time when he was here at the college, but he was rejected on medical grounds, so he didn't serve in the war. But he did something far more significant. He loaned Stansted Hall to the Red Cross and it became a convalescent hospital for over 5,500 soldiers. And during that time, there would be 110 soldiers being cared for by about 30 to 35 nurses throughout that time. But significantly, that was an incredible amount of people that were looked after in the hall. The hall was also, after that time, it was, oh no, before that time, it was also um, a place where lots of the local evacuees came until they were rehomed in nearby houses. So it was quite a special place where, and I think that extends for me the, the fact that Arthur Finley is such a generous gentleman. And certainly that's, re that's reflected in a lot of the conversations I've had with people that actually knew him. At the Stansted Hall, um, Arthur Finley was a farmer, he was a magistrate, as I already said, and of course, he was the author, as we all know. He was, uh, of course, a landowner. When he purchased Arthur Finley College, or the Stansted Hall, he purchased it with the intent of, um, of using the two farms that he purchased at the time. The hall was often open for public functions throughout the year, and he was very generous and he also very much interacted and supported the local community. Him and Gertrude certainly loved entertaining and they had lots of people, notary publics come here. And um, one that was documented in history quite a lot in his, in his um, scrapbooks was his meeting with the Crown Princess of Germany. So Arthur met Gertrude via his brother John. Um, they met in Leicester. And they, they met, in fact, at his parents' dinner table. Um, they, they got on obviously very well. Um, they had a second date the very next day over afternoon tea. And believe it or not, he got engaged to Gertrude just one month after meeting her. Arthur married Gertrude on the 15th of July in 1913. And Arthur and his wife moved into Stansted Hall in 1926, 
having purchased it in 1923. They paid just £8,800 and he was 43 years old. Now, I know lots of this information by something very special that happened to me a couple of years ago because I met a lady called Patricia Mum. Now, Mum, yes, it was champagne, very much related to it because it was her grandfather that was the founder of Mum Champagne. So Patricia, when I met her, had, was the right old age of 99 years old and she had all her faculties, let me tell you. But she was, when she came to Stansted Hall, she was just the tender age of 10. But for three years, she lived with Arthur Finlay and his family, and she was living here with um, a private, being privately educated with um, the governess, and she shared a bedroom with Margaret, the Finlay's daughter. She, Patricia tells me that children during the Finlay time, um, they were seen and not heard, but they did say that they, she felt very, very loved. Um, she referred to them as, as um, Uncle Arthur and Auntie Gertrude, which I thought was quite lovely. Now, she tells me that when the children were around, they were kind of scurried away. They weren't allowed to see all of these notary publics that came through the door. But people like Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, she recalls coming to the house, and also Countess of Warwick. And they used to go into the... the let the library and they used to have seances and have very serious meetings about um, spiritualism. One thing was important which I found interesting is that when she talked to me about Arthur she said despite now knowing everything about him with regards to his um, involvement in spiritualism and mediumship she ne he never once um, introduced the children to it and it was it was something they never really talked about. Can you? Yeah. I'll stop you there. It's all, it's all right. I'm just uh, concerned about time. Uh, clearly, Paul or Tanya don't understand the concept of five minutes. Bless you both. And equally, it's very, very difficult to get the life of such important people into five minutes. So I know I asked the impossible of you both. Um, can I, 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 I very much want to open up to, to, to the audience because I'm sure they've got their questions they'd like to ask. Paul, very quickly before we do that, can I just ask you, Gordon obviously met Arthur Finlay. Yes. And did he ever talk to you about that? He never really said, said, said a lot. Um, I, I know he gave sittings to Arthur Finlay, but I think the main story is where Gordon was travelling home and he got lost and found himself near Arthur Finlay, uh, near, near Arthur's home, near the, uh, which is now the Stansted Hall. And um, Gordon went to see if he could stay, ask Arthur if he could stay the night and um, it was early hours in the morning and Gordon was asked to wait in the library and when Gordon went into the library there was a monk there that then asked Gordon that if he would become the president of the, uh, the union and Gordon didn't realise he was a spirit at the time um, Gordon thought it was actually a real living human physical person and uh, of course afterwards Gordon said where did the monk go and nobody knew what Gordon was on about so uh, so Gordon knew him before he became the president um, so I know Gordon would have given sittings and, and visit him on occasions as well yeah brilliant brilliant Alv do we have any questions or does do people just want us to carry on <laughs> I will invite questions now. I think everybody has just been uh, riveted to Paul and Tanya and what they've had to say. Uh, so if you've not got your participants box open, now's the time to do it. And you'll find a little button that says raise hands. If you want to raise your hand, uh, we'll know that you want to ask a question or make a comment. Or you can also put it into the chat box as well. I'm sure with these two amazing pioneers are some things that perhaps you'd like to ask. So if you'd like to uh, do that, uh, I can ask the question. I can't believe you're all being quiet this week. Awesome. <laughs> they usually can't wait to get going. <laughs> so, uh, uh, John in the chat box has asked, how can we find out more about Gordon other than his book? Good question. 
Uh, well, there's there's um, there's plenty now on um, on the internet um, on YouTube. There is a, um, a website that's been set up um, in his name, all about his work. And there's many demonstrations and lectures um, on YouTube now. Actually, there's quite a lot you can experience of Gordon now through through the internet. So it is worth looking. Um, there's one or two things I've seen on the internet which has um, brought back many memories, you know, um, of what he thought and his ideas and and his teaching that, you know, um, brings back to memory because you can't always remember everything. So it's worth searching the internet and looking. And I've, I believe there are some uh, of your memories on YouTube as well, aren't there, Paul? Is it? Do you have a, meet, uh, a conversation with Mavis Spatilla about him? I'm yes, sure yes, you... yes, 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 me and Mavis have spoke, but yeah, we've done so. many things about him. But, you know, but there's, proper, there's a lot of formal um, lectures and demonstrations and services he, he, he did as well, that's available. It's definitely worth um, looking at him. Brilliant, thank you, Paul. So Rachel, I'm going to invite you to unmute your microphone and come into the room and ask your question. Rachel, could you unmute? Yeah, there you go. Off you go, Rachel. Had a bit of difficulty. So this is a question for Paul. And it's just a quick question. Um, people have talked about the presence of Gordon when he entered the room and how it was electrifying could you just tell us a little bit about his power and his presence paul yes certainly and that's what made the difference with the man it wasn't just his mediumistic ability it was the power and the presence and very much in his teaching um, at the Arthur Finley college because in those days um it wasn't about all group practical work it was about coming together as a spiritual family and understanding and uh, to understand the power of the spirit and the knowledge behind that power and how it could be used and really that's what mediumship is all about in demonstrations is being able to awaken that reality of the eternal spirit power uh, and, and to encourage people to find that reality for themselves and that power um, um, is there for all of us not just for Gordon but he, 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 it was just unbelievable and um, I could be um, at, at say our church the one end of the room and I'd have my back to the entrance and the door would open and I would you know without turning round Gordon had walked in um, at the college he might be like arriving later in the day and you could feel the atmosphere beginning to change and I can remember he always used to do his work as the uh, library was the main lecture room and uh, he transferred it to the sanctuary. And I said, why have you moved to the sanctuary? He says, the power in the library I built is strong and stable enough. He says, I now need to build the power in the sanctuary. Um, so he was very much, and some of the things he taught us as mediums, the one exercise quickly when one of the last exercises when he said to me, um, Paul, I want to contact as far back in the sanctuary as possible. And I said, why and how? He said, that's for you to find out. So I did it. And what it was about, the reason why, was to be able to use and manipulate the power. And after taking him to Scotland to do a demonstration, I think it was 2,000 people, and um, it was... A, amazing demonstration and he demonstrated for nearly two and a half hours solid and on the way home I says Gordon how can you demonstrate to such a degree for so long when most of us struggle for 30 minutes and he just smiled and he says two things one you've not developed your power enough and two you don't know how to use and manipulate that power and that is the foundation to development but everybody wants to jump into the mechanics and the practical exercises you know what we should be doing and that was his foundation is develop the power that will unfold the mediumistic gifts that are there everybody wants to put the cart before the horse okay yeah. thank you paul That's good. i could talk to you for two hours on your book yeah. <laughs> thank you <laughs> thanks paul for that brilliant thank you, paul. the question they know yeah we're going uh, over to the chat chat box for a moment and it's a question for tanya uh and uh Jan is asking uh, if you remember when you went for your interview for your role as a general manager at the, the college, what was it that Im impressed you 
about the place because obviously hearing you talk we can hear the great enthusiasm you have and those of us that know you know how very passionate you are um, and I'm going to roll into it another question as well which is um, are there any plans for you or anyone else do you know of to write a book about Arthur Findlay? That's the goal. I'm going to answer that one first because that's the golden question I get all of the time. Will you write a book? Well, I'd love to, but it's just getting the time to be able to do it because there's so much information that's all in here, believe it or not. And I'd love to do that, not just on Arthur, but of the college, the history. And I certainly, if I pass to spirit or when I do, I don't particularly want to take it all with me. So hopefully David will give me the time to write it one day. <laughs> A job yeah, for it retirement, is, Tanya, a job for the retirement. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's just one of those things I'd love to do. And I often speak at my lectures and I like to raise money for the colleges, particularly the gardens. Um, so whenever I get the opportunity and tutors invite me on their weeks to say, give us a, a lecture, then of course I like to share my story. And obviously, longer than five minutes, David. <laughs> yeah but um yeah no there's so much i do know um going back to my interview my goodness i remember that well um i think i had about five interviews in all um and one of them the final one was in the library and there was about a panel of about 12 people all together and all i can say is that this um the board were so focused on getting the right person and I, so obviously it was a privilege when I was employed, but believe you me, it was a tough interview. And um, the, I think the final interview lasted about an hour and a half, two hours. And it wasn't, well, I, of course I had a lot to say, but they were really, really tough on me. And, and um, you know, but for obvious reasons. But the way that the, the student, I walked around the college and I saw the enthusiasm, enthusiasm of the students and the love that they had for this place. And I just felt, you know, it was this kind of place that I felt I could do so much for and, and enjoy my work. And I certainly wasn't disappointed. So I hope that answers your question. Brilliant. Thank you, Tanya. Uh, we have another question uh, from, the, from the chat box, which I'm going to ask while the rest of you are thinking of the next questions. Uh, and I think it's to Paul. Uh, and it comes from Helen and she's asking about Gordon's Guide uh, Light uh, and something about it written within an envelope and is there anything that you can share about that please Paul? Okay I think, uh, forgive me for saying it, Helen you're just a slightly little confused um, on the way I've read your question um, because Gordon Higginson's spirit name was Light and then there was a guy that would only come and speak on Christmas morning um, at Longton Church where Gordon gave the address in trance and the guide was light, who would then come and give prophecy for the world for the year ahead. So that's to do with the guide light. With the name of light written in an envelope was written, um, and put in an envelope, um, I, I, I'll be honest with you, I can't quite remember whether it was in, in the prophecy before um, Gordon was even born or whether it was afterwards, but then Gordon was out taking a church service and um, in those days, as um, many of you know, um, there was always a speaker and a demonstrator. And in those days, Gordon wasn't a speaker, he was only a demonstrator. And he actually, um, he thought, fell asleep and woke up and apologised that he dozed off and he hadn't, he'd just done a trans address. And, um, and in that trans address, they, he was told that if he went, uh, that he was to be told afterwards to go home and speak to his mother and he would find that his name would be, spirit name would be written in an envelope that his mother would give him, um, which the, um, um, they announced, which, the uh, controller in that demonstration gave of light. So that was with the name in the envelope. It was to do Gordon's spirit name, not his guide's name, but there was a guy called Light. Thanks Paul for that, that's brilliant. Thank you. Um, staying in the chat room, we have a question from Chloe, and, and again to Paul. Uh, Chloe asked, do you think that we will ever see any mediums uh, of, of the same ilk as, as Gordon again? I'd love to say yes. Um, I think what we have to accept is, okay, um, 
you know, I, I think we're all born with them. Um, you know, we're either born with the faculty of mediumship or we're not. It then depends on how we develop it and our motive and intent of the use of it. That also makes a difference in the uh, quality and the degree of our mediumship. But like in any other walk in life, I think there are those just odd individuals that were born for that particular reason in different walks of life, like great leaders, great scientists, great musicians, whatever. And as many of you know, Gordon's birth was predicted um, and what he would do for service of spiritualism and the spirit before he was even um, born when his mother was a young girl. So I think really to say, you know, will there be others like Gordon? I think, you know, if there is, again, there'll only be one, you know. Um, I will like to say, if you don't mind, you know, um, again, it was something I was listening to on tag recently, and Gordon, you know, was saying, and he's very old, he was disappointed about the standard of mediumship. But what he did say was, it wasn't because there wasn't the potential. He said, there's people out there with the potential, but they're not developing it correctly and training it right. And I believe even today with the people I meet, there's people there with a wonderful potential, but it depends on the commitment, the dedication, and the right development and training. So I believe the potential's there to have a good standard and a higher standard than what we have. And that's not any criticism of anybody, but it, you know, but that's what we've got to look at, folks. But to do that also, we've got to be able to be honest and truthful uh, with ourselves, for one. You know, um, I'm very truthful about myself. I don't need to, to anybody to tell me about my, whether my work's good, bad, or indifferent, because I can be honest and look at myself with it. And I very much believe we've all got to become our own teachers if we're going to fulfill that true potential of our mediumship, you know. And if it's there, I don't believe the spirit world or God will say, oh, I like Paul, I'm going to give good Paul a good ability. I'm going to have uh, Al, but I'm not so keen on Al, so I'm not going to give him such a good ability. It's either there or it isn't. And it's then uh, where we develop it and how we train it and the commitment to it. Okay, oh, that answers it, okay. I can come Please. in there, Al. Uh, I'd just yeah. like to say, um, Sorry, Alf, can I come in? Yeah, of course, go ahead. Uh, I remember listening to Gordon speak on many occasions and talking about um, people wanting, him wanting to be progressive and for people to be better than he was. Uh, right. I don't know whether we've ever quite achieved that, um, but I, I think we lose a lot if we try to emulate others. Uh, the very nature of mediumship. There'll never be another Paul Jacobs, believe it or not. He's <laughs> unique. <in> his <laughs> There's quite a few people who'd be pleased about that, but bless yeah. you. <laughs> but seriously, you know, I, I, I think we all need people to look up to and to aspire to, um, and we can learn from every experience. But having watched Gordon lecture, demonstrate uh, in trance uh, on many occasions, um, you know, he was always focused on the next generation being better than the last. And that's progress in, in, its, in a nutshell, if you like. And he believed the potential was there, David. Absolutely, yes. And, and, what, and I suppose, what we do with that potential. Yeah, the rest is up to us. And perhaps we need to realise that and recognise that in what we do ourselves. So, yeah. Good, good question. Sorry, Alf. OK, thank you. thank you. I'm going to uh, hop back into the, the room now and I'm going to ask Neil, who's got his hand up, if he'd like to uh, ask his question. Go ahead, Neil. And good evening, guys and, go and goals, if you like. Yeah. It, it, it's for Paul, actually. Um, I was wondering whether um, Gordon ever gave you any, um, any, any um, help or instruction on how to keep mediumship the longevity of a mediumship because I see so many come into it trained and then fade away for whatever reason and leave and leave mediumship behind. It's true. Gordon used to do a lecture, many are called but few are chosen. Okay. And I think again it, it, it goes back to the beginning where I said earlier on about the development of the power. It's the foundation to it all. I know for years, even from my beginning People used to say, Paul, the amount of work you do, you'll burn yourself out. I haven't stopped, I haven't slowed down after 30 odd years and I can still maintain it and keep in that power. And, you know, people have got to be strong if they want to do this. You've got to be strong mentally, emotionally, spiritually and physically. 
This is for the faint-hearted, you know. It's no good just putting your spiritual overcoat on and being love and light. You've got to be able to deal with everything, you know. And you can only deal with it if you've got that strength of power and that development within your own soul and your own spirit. But also that trust. Gordon very much believed on that power becoming a reality, but also part of your life. And, uh, and in a way, if you want to use the word God, some don't like the word, I don't have a problem. In a way, God's going to be in all that you are and, um, as a person and in your work as a medium. And that power, if you allow it to move you and have developed your sensitive enough and the power enough, then the spirit world can move us, direct us, uphold us in all that we are and will see us through all those things that will keep us on the road and keep us going. Even at the time, we might have our moments when we want to all um, walk away. I'm sure we've all experienced that at some time. But you've got to be strong to do this. I don't think people realise how strong you've got to be. But it's that foundation of that strength of that power that makes the difference. Oh, right. that's question. Thank you. Totally, totally Thank agree. You, got to be strong. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Neil. Thanks for asking that question. Um, we've got uh, not too long yet, but I want to try and get around as many of you as possible. So stay in the room for a moment. And Carolyn, can I ask you to unmute your microphone? Yeah, you're on. Would you like to ask your question? Well, yes. Uh, very quickly, Tanya, you mentioned FETs as the, as, uh, with, um, with Arthur Finlay. Um, is that the school he went to? Yes, absolutely. Yes, yeah, I believe yeah, it's actually pronounced Fetis, and yes. it's in Edinburgh, and it's um, it's also the school that, that Tony uh, Blair went to. But Certainly yeah, is. I, I didn't know if you knew how that it was pronounced Fetis. No, I but didn't. I, I thought if I said Fetis out loud, it sounded a bit strange, so um, yeah, I decided no, it, it to change fetis. it because I really wasn't yeah. sure. <laughs> yes, no, it is, it is Fetis, and... Thank you, and, and interesting. Um, also, I wanted to actually take up Barbara Spy's question, which she just actually, I see her hand is up, but um, basically her question to, to uh, Paul was, uh, did he share with you what your plans were, what his plans were or thoughts were about the movement of the SNU? I believe yeah. that's what the question yeah, was. Yeah, and, and it wasn't just with me, the one he did make publicly, I might get one or two want to shoot me down for this. So I'd first like to say um, um, I have no problem with church. I, I love a traditional church service. Um, but Gordon actually wanted to remove the word church. He wanted us to find another name other than church, but he didn't want centre. Um, and he said churches that run purely as churches um, in the future will not survive. So by that, it doesn't mean we've got to stop having our church services, so please don't take me wrong, but they've got to become more than just church services. He said they've got to become centres of light. They've got to become teaching centres. And again, um, which we, I know it's my main work, but you know, when I say teaching centres, I don't just mean teaching um, people to become mediums um, or healers. It's about teaching you know the understanding and then the way really what he did at the college with all the lectures and tutorials about this power and the reality and, and, and the message behind it and people finding that reality for themselves of of this power uh, within their own lives and how they can use it and manifest it and that's what a change he wanted to bring because you know if we look in all religions and um, you know they're having in the, particularly in the Western world, you know, they're struggling for numbers. They're having to close churches down. Um, people don't want to be preached at. You know, they want to find, and I think this is why things like, like Buddhism does well, because it's their practices to, to teach, to have to find their own spiritual understanding. I know when I went to Longton Church, first of all, and after a couple of months, Gordon said, how are you finding coming to our church? And I said, I don't think it's for me. And he says, oh, why? And I said, because I've come to find out whether God exists. And um, I've come, if God does exist, I want to know God. And he took that service night and that night, and of course, the address was all about that. And I think that's what Gordon's main teaching was. And that's what I, I believe he wanted for our churches. But he felt people are a little bit against the word church and that, but try and get people to ch change that word. And unfortunately, he couldn't find 
he hadn't found a word to replace church with. So if any of you got, got any ideas or inspiration on that, let us know, because uh, that would be uh, that would be good. But the government these centres of light, and what he tried to do, I was working with him on, and even though I wasn't a working medium then, because he knew his time was limited, and again, he wasn't totally happy with the teaching throughout our movement at the time. And what he wanted to do, he wanted to find 10 excellent teaching mediums. And then he wanted a team of 50 good teaching mediums. And then he wanted to then, for that 10 to travel through the country to our churches or districts, and then have the backup team of 50 to follow through the teaching he wanted, but also this in a way the, we're all individuals to all our churches, but unfortunately, he couldn't manifest it before we went. Okay, so, hope that answers your question, okay? Thank you, Paul. We, we've just got a few minutes left, so I want to just get one more question. I think we can manage, and I want to ask Tanya on behalf of I've lost where I am, but the question is Tanya, do you know if Arthur Finlay has made any contact through a medium and? Do you often hear any accounts from people that they feel is present uh, around Stansted Hall? Absolutely. I've had um, many opportunities in which one I was with Lynn Cottrell on the platform during a uh, Sunday divine service here at the college. And he came through with some incredible evidence that nobody really in the room knew except for me. And it was really very strong. So, yes, he certainly came in through and and um, gave me a message, which was lovely. But yes, he's, a, he's made a few appearances and I've certainly felt his presence around the hall. Um, yes, I might not be a spiritualist by, by certificate, but I certainly have, you know, the beliefs down to the core through my heart, you know? So, um, but yeah, no, I've been in the hall and felt his presence. So certainly, he's certainly alive and well and, and, um, and keeps a good, um, stern eye on us so that it's it's nice so yes thank you tanya we're almost out of time so i am going to hand back to david for uh, his final comments on our audience with the president today david thank you al and i'd like to just make a big thank you to paul and tanya um, clearly an hour wasn't enough. I think a week would be better. That would be good. Um, yeah. and, um, <laughs> you know, if you think about it, and you may think, why on earth did we try and put these two titans of spiritualism into an hour's session? Um, I think it's important because the work of both Arthur and Gordon actually complemented each other. And I know Gordon worked really, really hard in the tough times to get Stansted Hall and the Arthur Finlay College established when there came a point at the end of the 90s that we nearly had to sell the building because of the state things were in financially. And um, within eight years of Gordon's passing, the college began the process of turning round and becoming the success that it is today. And I'm certain that Gordon and Arthur are still very interested in what's happening at Arthur Finley College within the wider spiritualist movement and the challenges that we make. And just to come back to a point that Paul raised, um, we're still looking for that magic word to replace church. Good. 30 years out, nearly after Gordon passed, uh, <laughs> we're still searching that. And I've heard that debate and discussion up and down the country. Um, we're not sure whether the church is right, but what do we replace it with? And if, if, if Gordon can bring something from the spirit world, uh, my ears are open, I can assure you. Good, good. Um, just a quickie, can I just talk Tanya, what about a week at the college then, on, based on, on Gordon, uh, Gordon Ingerson and Arthur Finn? Wow. Sounds I, like a plan. I'm up for that, absolutely. <laughs> that would be brilliant. That's what yeah. we'll certainly have to see if we can do. Can I tell you, ladies and gentlemen, uh, in thanking both of my uh, guests this evening and everybody that's been here, that next week um, we have Minister Matthew Smith and uh, Eileen Davies, who will be talking about spirituality. And I'm sure that that's a subject that will equally fascinate and interest you. Um, our plans, Alvin and I have been working together on this uh, session. 
and our plans run up to the end of June. On Monday the 29th of June at the moment we have no, um, no nothing planned, no guests invited and what I'd like to do is ask you the audience what you would like. Uh, my email address is president at snu.org.uk and I'm going to ask Elv to put that up into the chat box. Please email me if there's any subject that you'd like us to explore, if um, there's a speaker that you've enjoyed and would like us to invite back, um, because the plan is to actually bring the audience with the president uh, to close at the end of June. Um, but I assure you, ladies and gentlemen, that won't be the end of it because we do have plans going forward to bring it back, perhaps on a monthly basis. Um, it's been such an interesting experience and I've learned an incredible amount and I'm sure you have the same. So please join us next week for Matthew Smith and Eileen Davies on spirituality and a bin, again a big thank you to Tanya and to Paul. Uh, it's been a brilliant evening and thank you both for your contribution. Thank you. Cheers. You're welcome. Thank you, Danny. thank you Al, thank you Tanya. You're welcome, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, David. Uh, an absolutely fascinating discussion and just great insights into our pioneers that we, we might not otherwise have got had we, we not had these people here. So thank you. Before you go. Uh...